So Matt, it looks like we've got everybody and uh, Nan and Leon are on as well. Great. Well, Dan, thanks for sending. I know we've, um, before we kick off, let me just uh, pause and make sure that everyone got the materials that Dan uh, sent around in advance. I know there were a, a few emails, um, one today, I believe, and including um, Leon's presentation. And then one, I believe, was that, was that on Sunday, Dan, that included um, some cost comparisons um, and the minutes from last meeting. So uh, Todd and Brian and, and Linda, did you, did you did you get all those? Okay, great. Um, I know we've kind of, we've got a full agenda for today. Um, and what we wanted to do was kick off um, after after we approve the minutes and take a quick quick peek at some of the preliminary cost estimates um, that have come back in for the two different sites. Um, I know we several weeks ago now talked about the capital uh, structure, um, both the sources and uses side of that, but I think we have a little more definition around some of those numbers. I think for informational purposes, these were um, items uh, that were talked about in the facilities committee, but for those of you who weren't able to attend that meeting. I think this will be a good framework for us to have uh, presented to us. And then shifting um, over to Leon has prepared a presentation that really gets more into the operational side. So I don't have a, um, I think it's, it's good information here on the capital side, on the sources and uses. I'm not, uh, and I think it'll inform the discussion um, as we move into the operational side. But before we, we dive in, um, did anyone have any questions or comments on the minutes? Okay. Hearing none, um, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. All right, thanks, Brian. Can I get a second? Second. All right, seconded by Todd. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, all right. Um, Dan, did you want to jump into the presentation on the updated um, preliminary costs for the MSC site and the Kingsdale site? I think Nan Weir is on the call. Oh, Nan, so great. I'm sorry, I didn't present that. Information. Scroll down here. Nan's on. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, so just to give you all kind of where we are in the process is, so it was submitted for the last um, facility subcommittee meeting on the 26th, was still kind of blocking and stacking diagrams and then really preliminary budgets based on those blocking and stacking diagrams, just showing kind of the high range and the low range of cost. And since that time, so we have been taking the next step of the development in the concept plans and also on the budget side. Um, so Williams has completed just as of this morning, our updated costs, which are still within that higher range um, shown um, for the community center, also looking at the commercial office space. And then we also put a number on the partner space and we are also then vetting those numbers with to local um, contractors just to be sure that we have that right. Our numbers are from our national database from past projects. And so also just trying to be sure we're adjusting that properly for this market, which is why we're gonna be testing that locally. Um, so we feel like we're on track for that, working towards the next finance or facility subcommittee meeting next Monday. Um, so we're still in the range that we've shared and we're just, doing it from a little bit different, um, looking more at the unit costs for each element in the program. So we're coming at it from a different perspective, but we're, we're landing on about the same number. So we feel pretty good about that. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions about what was submitted or if you want me to get into a little more detail or if, if that's um, what you wanna, want me to cover for today. Nan, I thought the summary sheet that uh, or that Dan provided in his email is really helpful. Is there a way that you could screen share that? Yeah, do you want to? Um, yeah, let me. I can I have it open here? I just need to find the right one. Yeah. OK. 
Okay, so let me know when you're seeing that. Are you seeing that yet? Yep. So this was showing both the MSC and the Kingsdale sites. And for this next round of meetings, we've been really asked to focus our effort on the Kingsdale site um, to take it to the next level of development. So you can see here that um, this particular summary shows just the community center at 95,300 square feet and the, um, the total project cost range between 46.1 million and 51 million is what we're showing and our, our latest estimates are just under the 51 million um, for the community center only. And then I think we also had sent, or Dan sent the more detailed um, cost estimates that really were the backup for this summary. I also have those open if you want to look at those. Yeah, he, he did. Um, I, I guess a couple of questions, and I think these were these were kind of broken out a little bit in the, in the um, breakout sheets, but as you pull together this summary, does this include the two stories uh, of office space in those numbers, or is that just the community space? This is just the community center. So in the next round of numbers, and actually, um, well, the, the one we've been working on this morning, finalizing, has um, numbers for the community center, the additional cost of the commercial office space, and also if we include a partner, which you know we have not so far, and then there's floor area shown in the stacking diagram for a partner. Um, we just thought you ought to know that cost and some of that may be funded differently or offset by leases and or capital partner participation, but we thought that this committee would ultimately need to know those costs for those other elements as well as, um, as everybody's looking at how to fund this project. So we should be having an update on that. Um, later this week or early next week. And, and just for clarity, this doesn't include um, in the square footage or in the cost structured parking, correct? Well, it includes only the parking that's in this building. Okay. So my understanding is that the TIF is picking up the cost of the parking garage and the roads and development as part of that site development, the alley. Um, so this includes the, there's really like 20 spaces approximately under the building and 40 along the alley. Um, so this does include that. Nian, your estimate includes uh, parking for the MSC site though, right? That's one of the big differences in cost. It is because, you know, there's not another partner there um, developing that site. So... Yeah, that is one of the big differences. Yeah. Just can I add something? We were, what we were trying you want to want me to stop sharing? No, you can leave it up there. Sorry, okay. I'm jumping in. But when we were looking at it from the facility side, we were trying to understand the apples to apples comparison between Kingsdale and MSC, meaning so there was a reasonable comparison. So if you added obviously the office in, that's not a reasonable comparison because, you know, but at MSC, we knew we had to add in rebuilding the administ, you know, the city hall, because that has to be done if you're going to build the, the um, community center there. So what we're showing on the Kingsdale side doesn't necessarily represent everything that has to be paid for. But in terms of the apples to apples comparison, as far as site to site, that's what this chart does. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And there's other there's other nuances there. Obviously, when you get into the financial deal of what happens with the TIF and you know all that kind of stuff and in the office building, et cetera, but. Um, that wasn't what this was all about, this chart, so. 
And maybe, um, Dan, your, your memory may be better than mine. Can you remind us when we, and I think, I believe it was our first finance committee meeting, or maybe the second one, when you walked us through the capital stack at that point, what was the number? I feel like the number was more around 400 per square foot that you were holding in that, or can you remind us how that looked um, at the outset? You have a good memory. Uh, I was using $40 million and a hundred thousand square feet. So it was that $400 okay. per square foot number. Okay. Question for Linda. Although land cost is not broken out, is the land cost in here? No, the land acquisition cost is not part of this. And it should be noted, Linda, that um, we believe the acquisition cost for the Kingsdale site is going to be about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So, still, a, you know, significant number, but not enormous. So there, there are two things that are baked into the TIF. One is the parking, and the other is the land acquisition. So, the tax increment financing district, uh, we're projecting bringing in seventeen point nine eighteen million dollars. Included in that would be the cost of the parking. Um, at the uh, Kingsdale site, as well as the land acquisition, um, as well as any on-site and site adjacent uh, infrastructure. So the traffic lights, uh, crosswalks, that kind of stuff is all included in that TIF um, package that we're working on with the developer in the school district. Great. So, and, and to give you all a sense of what it, what kind of the, we gave a presentation last night um, to council and the, the continental project between the TIF and the land acquisition, it's a $30 million. So if somebody said, well, why don't you just buy the land and build a community center on, on that six acres? It's a $30 million swing uh, between the cost of the land and the value of the TIF. So it's $12 million uh, for the TIF or for the land acquisition and $18 million in, in TIF revenue. So if you get it, if you get a question from anybody who says, well, did you look at just simply buying it and building a community center? That's the swing uh, from a financial standpoint of having the continental partnership in there. Sorry, I broke in and kind of took you in a little different direction, but that was something that came up last night that I thought would be helpful for this group to understand. Hey, Steve, that's and we're also great. just assuming on the site work costs that, you know, the, if there's main utilities coming to the site that we'll be able to just tie into those. So we're caring a little bit for utility connections. Um, we're not carrying road improvements for the alley or the drive, you know, in front of the community center. We're assuming that that's part of the, that TIF work. Hey, Steve, that, that was really helpful background. For those of us who aren't TIF experts, could you give a 10,000 foot overview of, of why that is? Yes, I'd be happy to. And one of the things we're gonna do for council next week is we'll, we'll actually kind of put this in. We're, we're, our, our goal is to explain TIFs in four to five uh, slides. So that's the you know, that's the homework assignment for the week. We'll see whether we can do it or not, but I'll see if I can do it in, in shorter firm, shorter uh, basis. Basically, so Frank's development is gonna be, let's call it, Frank being Frank Cass with Continental, the development's gonna be, let's call it a $120 million development. Um, that's gonna throw off a whole bunch of income tax re or property tax revenue that we're gonna redirect into a tip. Um, that TIF, uh, that redirection, seven, we're going to go out and sell bonds based on that. Those bonds will generate, we believe, um, 17 and a quarter million dollars for the developer and let's call it 18, 17.9, $18 million for us. So those bonds can be sold based on that revenue can be sold for whatever 17.9 and 17.25 is, um, that money doesn't exist. <clears throat> that new revenue generated by <clears throat> the property taxes from that doesn't exist if the private development on that site doesn't happen. So the entire the the financing depends on there being a private de private taxable development 
on that site that throws off that amount in potential property taxes that can be captured and plowed back into the project. The use of those funds, is, as we're proposing, it will go into two things. One is paying for the park, kind of paying for that first bucket that I said, which is parking infrastructure and land acquisition of our site, um, all of which are, are public goods. The, the parking garage will be publicly owned um, through the Columbus Franklin County Finance Authority. Um, so all that gets paid for by that 17 and a quarter. And then we can use the, the 17.9 that's left over um, to help fund the community center. I think that's about as quick as I've ever explained it. Um, was that helpful, Todd? That was, thank you. So, so Nan and Greg, I, I think it's a, it's a really helpful update. And I, I think a couple of big takeaways, at least, um, you know, we're, we're, it, it looks to be like we're within a 10% variance of where we were a, a few months back on looking at the sources and uses um, at the Kingsdale site, as far as the construction costs were floating maybe four or 5 million upwards of where we were at, but still within, um, a reasonable delta or, and, and you were I think expressing Nan that um, these are internally driven numbers from your databases and you've got two general contractors um, looking at that conceptual pricing for you it, you mentioned a meeting next week I, what, what's a timeline do you think when you'll have some verification on those numbers from those third parties and realizing it's all conceptual at this point and still a lot of variables floating around yeah, I'm hoping we'll have to meet for that finance committee next Monday. And um, so, you know, I, I don't know for sure if we will, but that's the goal. Okay. So early next week, we should have kind of verification of these numbers, which you would for sure have it. You know, I think we could share that. Well, I guess it's up to, the, <laughs> to you all who, how and when that gets shared, if that gets shared before the next finance subcommittee meeting or, or what you do with that, but. I think I think you're are you referring to the the, the Greg's facilities committee next month Monday? Yeah. Yeah. So we okay. have a meeting okay. on the sixth okay. at four o'clock. Okay. Actually, it's the ninth. Never mind. It's the ninth. <laughs> Makes Matt, sense. Matt, we should mention that we've also um, <clears throat> a little bit behind the scenes employed uh, the city's financial advisor, uh, Bradley Payne to assist us with looking at um, some of the information that I presented to you uh, some weeks ago in a much more detailed fashion uh, involving some of the other area TIFs as well as the TIF that we're talking about for the uh, Continental uh, site um, to kind of verify what are the um, revenue sources and, and what's, the, what's the delta um, between those revenue sources and what the capital expenses that uh, Williams is presenting. So. Um, if there was interest, we could also um, present that information at a future uh, meeting. Hey, Matt, what, can I just ask one kind of comp set to level set my, uh, with respect to design at the Kingsdale Center, with respect to relative community centers? I know this is going a bit off the finance topic, but why we have Greg here. Um, although I see an empty screen, so he may have stepped away. Um, that 95,000 square feet, how does that compare to other, to other community centers from a size perspective? I think Leon can probably answer that question pretty well, um, or, or Debbie, maybe you remember, um, but put it in comparison to Westerville, I think their existing facility, uh, before the expansion uh, was right around 100,000 square feet. And I think they're gonna be at 145 afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, Correct. And on the design, some of this I think is, is harder to do over Zoom and, and while you're looking at drawings, but like the layout and as you go on a multi-story facility, do we feel confident the size of like the basketball courts and the field areas are big enough or are we squeezed on that site so that those are like, you know, partial size? 
Where we are with that right now, and we've been working with Continental, you know, very early in the process to be sure that we had the depth to put in full high school size courts with adequate space around them. And, you know, we're going to be overhanging the alley a little bit on the upper floors and able to be able to accommodate that. But, you know, it does squeeze us because we're vertical and there will be some implications in terms of square footage, um, which is part of what we're really trying to vet right now because we will have to have extra locker rooms because we're not all on one level, you know, so we're going to have to have more toilet rooms. We're going to, you know, there are some things like that and we might not have as big a gallery spaces, but so far we're pretty much on program. Um, and this next round of concept development, we're taking a more realistic look at, you know, we're drilling down into a little bit more to really understand kind of the implications of that stacking in terms of those support spaces. Um, but we're not making a compromise in the functionality of the basketball courts at this point um, because we were able to work out that that building depth with continental and it's so it's, it's just for conceptually for the the biggest like open area would be the size of a basketball court like for the there are there bigger fields like soccer type fields or well like, there aren't any indoor like soccer fields so the biggest the biggest space we do have three gyms so um, that's our, and they're all on one floor. So they're all together in a, in a sort of single location with the massing and then the track runs around that. And, um, you know, that's our biggest space. I mean, the next biggest space would be the aquatic space. Um, so we haven't. Do those spaces get bigger at MSC? No, they're actually programmed the same size. So we've been able to accommodate that at either site in the same way. It's just, you know, there's a little bit different in terms of how the support spaces are, are handled. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I know I want to move on to the um, Leon's presentation because I know that uh, there was a lot of questions in the uh, two weeks ago um, about you know, diving a little deeper in the operational side. Um, this is really helpful. I appreciate Nan and uh, Greg and Dan kind of giving us an update on where we stand on the cap, on the construction costs. Um, I th it would probably be helpful once we get, you know, some validation from those third-party general contractors and Dan, once there's a little more refinement on the capital structure um, to run back through that PowerPoint um, using the updated, you know, refresh numbers and um, the third-party pricing that's been provided. Um, with, I, I know we've got it. We've got about 35 minutes left, and unless uh, Brian or Linda, did you have any other questions regarding the preliminary, you know, the conceptual pricing? It, okay, um, Leon, I'd love to hand it over to you to um, kind of walk us through the operational components um, and leave a little time for discussion here uh, at the end of the hour on your presentation. Leon, are you able to share your screen if you've got the PowerPoint up? Or Nick? Yeah, I can share. He, I, I'm wondering if he's frozen. He looks stuck. <laughs> yeah, that worried me for a minute. He kind of get. Uh, I thought I was getting a really puzzled look. Like, why are you going to me? So, <laughs> now he's back. That's his, that's All right. Poker face. <laughs> All right. I'll, okay. Leon, I'll get the screen share going here. Okay. Uh, well, thanks a lot. I don't know what happened, but I lost you there. But. Um, Anyway, Matt, what we wanted to do today was just kind of highlight. I know that we set out a set of assumptions that was sent out over the weekend and uh, also the performer itself. And this is kind of a summary of that, just so as we go through it. Um, so these assumptions really help us to organize the facility operations. And uh, it's really built around um, some of the uh, goals of, that we started with. Originally, when we uh, sat down with the staff, uh, our goal was to be somewhere in the 80% category, if not greater. But these, this uh, information can vary and it will vary based on uh, the size of the building, the location, and if there's partners involved. But we, this is a baseline for our discussion.
but it really demonstrates um, pretty much where we see this building performing based on the um, four uh, spaces that are involved and also for the type of programming that we anticipate to be in the building. So um, I just want everybody to know I'm in an airport. So if you hear an airport signal or if there'll be an announcement, I, I apologize, but I'm catching a flight and I just want everybody to know that up front. So um, the, we're looking at a building that's open from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, we're looking at the priority one, which was, and I know there's been some adjustments uh, from Nan uh, and on the on the size of the spaces and that could vary, but currently we're working off of baseline of 91,000 square feet. There are 10 core uh, spaces in the building like athletics, aquatics, fitness, seniors at, that go that support the building and approximately about 60% to 65% of the building is dedicated to actual program space. Within that, then the revenues are coming from daily admissions and drop-in um, costs, punch passes, memberships, which we'll go over, recreation program costs, rentals, and, and vending. And uh, really, uh, the expenses is estimated based on staff input and comparable industry uh, rates that we have been have been doing this for a long time and some in the, in the Columbus area. And so we're using those numbers based on our experience. Uh, the staff gave us the percentage of the staff that would be that it is um, now um, uh, that would be working in the building and whether they're uh, tax supported or a percentage of their uh, salary is um, would be dedicated to the building and so we worked off of that percentages uh, for how the building so if somebody now like in the senior area they're being supported 100% from taxes we're not moving that those staff into um, recovering their costs um, because they're already tax supported. And we made sure that the, how they actually line up and the amount of work they would be doing in the building is applied to the building, but not necessarily um, uh, trying to have the building capture all of the uh, taxes that cover staffing now within the recreation div division. Next slide. So the daily fees, we have a value pack that's a kind of 10 visit approach that people can buy that. Um, so families come in town, grandkids show up, they can buy a value pack if they want that. So we have a facility admission that can include a child watch as well as a drop in fitness. Uh, so some people don't want to be a member, but they just want to do uh, group fitness. We have that op opportunity through a daily rate. Uh, we have a, a toddler three and under, child four to 17 and adult, 18 to 16 and senior. Uh, currently the senior program right now, we had this discussion on Friday uh, that we really are kind of looking at 62 as a starting rate. Um, so uh, that hasn't been um, uh, set uh, specifically, but it's been discussed and it kind of uh, from the staff's perspective uh, seems to make sense for this building. Uh, then there's a resident non-resident rate. The non-resident rate is 30% higher uh, than the resident rate. In terms of memberships, we have uh, four different types for seniors, which is an individual uh, membership, uh, a couple's members, oh, pardon me. Um, we have membership types, individual, couples, families, four, four people. Um, if there's more than four, then they pay extra for the, the next child and then seniors. Uh, so the monthly, if you're, if, if you join monthly, you get a 20% discount if you pay on an annual rate. And our, then we have a resident, non-resident rate, which is at 30% premium. And then the basic, we have a basic fee and a premier fee that includes all the options for all age segments. And then we have a senior rate, which right now they have a social senior membership and then they also and they also have um, a, uh, a program membership and then they have uh, the ability to be a non prime time membership and then or they can take the entire building just like any other person in the city. Uh, we compared our market rates with similar providers of Mason Dublin Westerville and Worthington and uh, we're pretty much um, in the middle uh, of that so. Um, 
as you look through this, you can kind of see where the individual monthly rate is and what it would be annually for an in individual and a non-resident. Uh, so the basic membership is the unlimited use of the facility during open recreation and priority registration for programs. Um, and then you can see where it is with a couple and a family of four and a senior uh, for uh, the basic membership. And then in the premier, which is unlimited use of the facility during all open times, priority registration. They also get 10 free guest passes so um, they can bring friends to the site if they want to. Uh, they have free child watch um, package and then they can go to all, all the drop-in group fitness programs um, if they register. And then the social membership for the senior, for the resident, and then for the non-resident, uh, senior health lifestyle membership, which is use of the pool facility during off-peak times. And then we have an additional child membership that's associated with it. And um, so these were uh, our numbers. Uh, so when we look- Leon, the Leon do you mind going back one slide? Um, this is really helpful. Uh, quick question. Help me understand the difference between the senior healthy lifestyle and just a senior basic membership. Well, basically, all community, all community centers have a prime time and a non prime time. And in that process that uh, like a non prime time in a building like this would probably be in the neighborhood between nine and 11 and from 130 until 330. And then uh, during the weekends, they would have uh, times that would be considered non prime time. What we're trying to do is, uh, uh, it's, it's almost like a uh, um, uh, variable pricing that's uh, kind of dynamic pricing. When the building is less used, we're trying to move seniors in and so that they're not conflicting when the building's most used in prime times. And yet uh, that way they have full access to the building. The social membership is really, they have a lot of different um, events and uh, special events and they have different um, potlucks and just different kinds of things that are more social and uh, and it's not driven by an activity that is uh, um, that has a fee associated with a class that's kind of the difference and just one maybe a follow-up question for debbie was is the really is that a market concept that's a hundred dollars a year for off peak hours or is that really something that was you know um driven by our historical the historical fee structure of our senior center um be, i mean it just it it kind of falls in line with what we see today so i'm just curious is that the thought process behind it yes that is okay. um, as well as looking at the regional markets for what other communities are charging for the same um off peak access to the facilities knowing that as Leon said, they could pay in the blue column for the basic and have um, all hours as opposed to just the loft peak. It does also come with some like, like silver sneakers types of programs, which is a Medicare supplement for seniors for fitness programs. That will also help offset the cost of um, health and wellness, nutrition, and physical exercise type classes. Thanks, Debbie. That's helpful. Sure. Thank you. All right, the next slide. So one of the things is, as uh, you all have talked about the membership market, and I'm going to have Nick, who's on the phone with us, uh, kind of walk through this because we had a lot of discussion about the market. We typically, when we do a feasibility study, we really pretty much look at a 12 to 15 minute drive time um, of the market. But because you have Worthington and Dublin and uh, other uh, community facilities relatively close, we narrowed that down to 12 minutes. And so the total population there of that make up a 12 minute drive time is 229,000 people. So Nick, you wanna just walk people through our, our uh, approach to this? Yeah, so you can see that 12 minute uh, drive time depicted in the map out to the right. That's the outer, uh, the larger shaded area, as well as you can see the central point that we use for the address, which is the Kingsdale Mall location. And the city is outlined there as well. Um, so we use that 229,000, that full 12 minute uh, drive time to determine kind of how the age breakdowns are. So you can see it's 17% under the age 18, 65% kind of that middle range, and then 18% for 60 and above. 
Um, we made some assumptions to use the, the population figures based on the age segment breakdowns. Um, so some of the assumptions we used were, you know, a family of four. Um, so we, we, the family number was really driven by that population under 18 um, and counting two kids for each family and two adults. Um, and then the remaining individuals, once you back out the families, we uh, we factored in to get to that couple rate. We factored about 30% of individuals will be uh, considered a couple. Um, and then from those breakouts, we then do a 3% capture rate. Um, so in the end, it, it's, it, that accounts for about 6,000, almost 7,000 individuals. And then we uh, split that across uh, the different um, kind of the predetermined levels between resident and non-resident. So we assume that 85% um, uh, would be on the resident rate. Uh, so there's people that live in the city or work in the city um, and 15% attributed to non-residents. Um, and then we uh, made the assumption that about 60% of pass holders would sign up for the basic. 40% uh, would be on that premier plan. Um, and then again, 60% uh, would be uh, spending or purchasing memberships on a monthly rate um, and 40% for the annual. So in the end, um, this, this results in about 5,840 actual uh, residents when you think of that 85% um, rate. And if you compare that to the city's population, which, which is just north of uh, 30,000, uh, it'll account for about 16% 16, 16 of the city's population which when we do this uh, in other cities and, and municipalities, um, it's, it's pretty common for a recreation center can capture anywhere from 20 to 30% of the local market. So, in, in and you can see the- Just in Westerville, it's over 30%, just so you're aware. Mm -hmm. So these are, this is a conservative number, um, but I think one of the most important things here, when we started this process and our assumptions, we wanted to, I'm jumping in on your neck, but the, uh, but we looked at 60% of the um, revenue coming from memberships and based on doing this model, we're at 66%, correct, Nick? Yeah, I think that's that's about, about right, yep. And you can see the uh, how the passes break out on the bottom right there. Um, so you can see the total passes across the different, um, the different types. Um, and then how that breaks down for, with the basic and the premier at the 60, 40% split. Any questions on that? So <clears throat> Leon and Nick, this is Steve. Quick question. Uh, I know one of the questions we'll get from the community is given these numbers, given the size of the center, will the center feel, feel overwhelmed? Do you feel like th these numbers present a financial, a financial package that doesn't have us overwhelming the center um, in order to make our numbers? A really good question, Steve. I, uh, we assume that 50% of the building would be made available for members. That means that they have a full use of the building, okay? And, um, but in those non-prime times or early and late, those classes, uh, one of the key components that came out of the work with the staff was they, they are programming this building at a really strong rate because they're, they have no other space. And, um, and so consequently, they made a really, they did a great job in approaching the programming of the space they had, which um, really gave us a good uh, cost recovery because of that effort to program it. And uh, you know a lot of agencies, and I've said this to the staff on Friday last week when I was over there, they tend to manage the facility first and the program second. And that is the direct opposite of the way you guys approach it. You approach that this is a building we've needed for a long time. And we uh, can program this building based on the needs of what they, they have demonstrated for a number of years that the public has asked for. But you still have to balance that off against where the building is available for the, for the members. And, on, and, and quite frankly, uh, when you have members that are in this kind of category, it'll be busy at different times of the day or different times of the year, but that is not an overwhelming number of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, members by any means uh, because everybody uses the building differently. 
Yeah, and I would just add to that, to, to Leon's point, with the way we program the facility is we are sticking to the membership access model of where, for instance, a gymnasium, there would always be a drop-in gymnasium available for people to come in for member use. So it's not always programmed, but where we do have program spaces, we're flipping the spaces as much as we can to offer all the programs that uh, we currently offer and those that our community members have desired. You know, what we typically like to see is buildings being programmed uh, somewhere between of all the spaces around 60 to 65%. In this case, we're up over 70, almost 75%. And that still gives some flexibility to the staff. But I, I just, one of the things I, I was enormously impressed with was how active and how well the, the staff had thought through the programming for the spaces. What was so the I know this is a as a follow up to Steve's uh, just as a follow up to Steve's question. Is there like a commonly used metric on square footage per yeah, um, user per membership? I mean, and what what is that well, metric? The, it's usually in the neighborhood of uh, two to two and a half uh, square feet per population served. Okay, and because we're we have a little bit larger population outside of the city, that's where that's coming from. So, um, uh, so, but even if the city uh, would be right at about uh, uh, 70 to 80 uh, uh, per, uh, square foot per population, uh, if it was just city only, but because you have people who work in the city, they'll use the facility and you have some uh, communities that are right around the, those townships right around the city, you're gonna draw in people from that. And so that's that's where the square foot, but the, the square foot number that people most use for a full community center that's got both all the all the major um, um, uh, amenities like water like water uh, that has warm water and moving water and uh, and uh, and gym space and walking track and uh, the kind of uh, uh, recreation sports space you have uh, it's right there we're right we're right at best practice of this map. So when you say Upper Arlington has uh, thirty-five thousand times two and a half, that's you know eighty something thousand I, feet. I lost required. you. You said two to two and a half square foot per person, and if the city has yeah. thirty-five thousand, that's where you end up at eighty, ninety thousand. Two square foot, foot would be seventy. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. Because I was curious how you know Westerville has 140,000, and I can't remember what they said at the when we had the tour last week, but how many people they serve. But I assume this is comparable in terms. Well, a two of, square foot per thousand, they would be they're a little over 50,000, so that's a hundred thousand. They did move their their senior center into this center, uh, but they have a large population of people who work there. And when you okay. work there, you are a resident, they count you as a resident. And so they have a good membership of people who don't live in Westerville, but work in Westerville. So that's where that number comes from. Got it. And, and, to and be Greg, clear on did, that, go ahead, Debbie. They did say that their pre-COVID, Westerville had a membership of about 9,000 and their goal with the, the expansion is to 12,000. Right. Obviously right. in COVID times, it's a bit different. But um, they did say there was quite a bit of the daytime because of the um, employment base. And just one other point, we feel pretty strongly that we want to follow that model in terms of treating <clears throat> treating employees as residents. Um, we think that's important. Uh, 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 employees are tax. Uh, what I would say is you can also think of the uh, resident rate as being the taxpayer rate. Mm -hmm. um, as you all know, uh, we tax folks based on where they work. And so having that kind of attitude about it, we think is important from a policy standpoint, so. And that is our current practice with, with pools and tennis membership. Okay. Other questions about this or our approach? You can see down here uh, that our total cost recovery is at 107, but I mentioned earlier, this will go up and down based on how the building rolls out, how much actual program space is available 
if there is a partner involved, how that partner will interface with, uh, with the building. Uh, but this is our first cut at it. Uh, I know you guys haven't had a chance to look at it. And, and actually last week, the staff just had a chance to look at it. So those will get massaged when we uh, actually see what building we're building and where it's gonna be located and how big it's gonna be. So I just, um, this is our, our approach to it. Hey, Leon, this is a Brian. Can I ask a quick question about uh, cost recovery? I know when we were very early on, possibly in the full study group, looking at, you know, comparables around, it looked like, you know, once these things mature, you get cost recovery that's closer to like, I don't know, 60 or 70% when you include all these CapEx costs, like, you know, needing to replace big components in aquatics and big components in HVAC and things like that. What what are the comparables that we looked at, like Westerville? What what's their cost recovery now that they've got kind of a mature, you know, consumer base? The, the council set their cost recovery goal at uh, I believe it's eighty five percent, eighty three or eighty five percent. And uh, the reason is when they moved over the senior center, the senior center was virtually uh, ninety percent cost recovery. So they didn't want to change that model and they were satisfied with the 83 to 85% um, cost recovery. Uh, I, you know, Dublin, uh, I talked to Matt about this. So they could be a lot more cost recovery, but they, they chose to, to subsidize things more like their theater and other areas within it that they feel like that they, they don't want to, they're not looking at a cost recovery goal. Um, I, my personal opinion about it, if you really look at the, the like a, uh, a membership of, of, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of for $27 for a month, for a month, uh, you know, I always look at this and, and, and apply it to food. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, that's going to McDonald's twice, basically, or maybe three times. So it's something that it, is, it, is it reasonable and, uh, and a, a couple or a family. So I, the biggest thing, this is a philosophical issue within the city, is this too strong? Um, but you know, the first year, it's gonna take a little bit of time to gear up and it's gonna be the timing of the first year. Um, and part of that is how much marketing money is spent up front to really get the members on. Uh, some people don't wanna buy anything in the, in, in, unless they can actually feel it and see it and walk in it. But certainly the, these numbers are realistic. They're not over the top by any means in my mind the biggest difference between Westerville and these other communities that we've done um, uh, feasibility studies are on is that the staff has programmed this building stronger than anybody we've worked with. So, so let me, Brian, let me see if I can ask your question in another way, because I, I think I know the question you're getting to. So you don't, you know, you don't have baked into these numbers. Well, let me ask the question. Do you have baked into these numbers anything to set aside a capital reserve? Yeah, we do. It's out down there's a maintenance endowment. We've established 5% of the budget um, towards a maintenance endowment. And really the maintenance endowment doesn't really kick in usually until, you know, the 10th year of a, a facility. You're going to have a minor breakdowns and things, but where you have to really start looking at asset changes. So when we're uh, trying to put in anywhere between 160 and 200,000 a year into an asset management fund for a replacement, uh, you know, we think that as uh, things come up in the 10, 15, 20 year, there's dollars there to do that. Yes, yeah, Steve, one, one of the other questions I think this subcommittee, possibly our full group will get from council is, you know, in, in the community centers around that have taxpayer dollars that subsidize operational expenses, you know, they're, they're going to, I think, look to our group to say, you know, moving forward, if we're at 80% or 85% cost recovery, what do we think the cost to the, the city or any par private partners we might have will be, you know, just in terms of operational expenses? I think that's probably one of the big questions that our finance subcommittee will get. What, what do the other entities do that don't get to 100% cost recovery? Do they use general funds of the city? Do they use, you know, partnerships? How do they, how do they fill the gap? Right, it's general fund typically, uh, income tax generation. Okay. So, and, and I'll just, I'll, you know, to the group, when we first saw these numbers, uh, we got really excited and then we said, well, 
hold on. Um, let's also be realistic about expectations. I don't want to go out there and set an expectation that we are we are banking on getting 110% cost recovery. Um, you know what these numbers tell me with where we are at this phase in a feasibility study, and this is what I'd like you all to ask you all, and I think what council will ask of you all is to dive in the, into this and say, are we comfortable with saying, yes, we think we can get to, we can be in this range of 85 to 85% 85 cost recovery to actually, you know, being able to um, fund some things a little bit more and do some, you know, have some additional funding to be able to put into programming and, and to be able to putting into, when I look at that, if you will, surplus, um, uh, you know, being able to operate either at cost recovery, even a slight surplus that would allow us to do some additional things in the community. I think that's when you ask kind of what's council going to ask you about, uh, what do I think they're going to ask you about? I think it's going through these numbers and saying whether or not you you are comfortable with um, kind of the homework that we've done and Leon's done to make sure that we've got um, the ability that you have the ability to really analyze the feasibility of, of the operational side financially and, you know, the long-term capital side. Um, cause that's something I think we've all been focused on. We don't want to build a, a Taj Mahal and, um, 10 years later, have it look like what looks there, what's there now. So, um, you know, that's, I think, uh, what we all want to protect against. My, um, I think that's a good point, Steve. And my assumption is that, um, your operating expenses that you've layered in here, we've got enough comparables um, and that those are solid numbers. And that my, I guess my, I would assume that those don't fluctuate um, in line with membership. So they're fixed costs that are um, whether, whether your membership is 2,200 singles, like you've got modeled out or it's 1,500 singles, your, your op operating expenses year over year aren't going to change dramatically. I think what would be really helpful to Steve's point is if we can do some some stress testing on the membership, because, you know, if we look and, you know, Leon, if you, you can provide some numbers to us that say, OK, membership at 80 percent of the um, at what's pro forma here, here would be our deficit. Um, I think that that will give us um, some talking points around what, what the potential gap could be if this pro forma doesn't work as anticipated. And I, I don't know okay. what the magic is, if it's, a, if it's an 80%, a 90%, a hundred, but I think providing some of that so that we can see the, the different gaps at, at different membership levels would be really helpful. Okay, I'll do that. Just to put a little bit finer point on what Steve Shoney was uh, mentioning, I think one thing that, uh, staff identified in looking at other centers around central Ohio was an element in Dublin's um, cost recovery model, which admittedly is, is not very aggressive, but any overage um, that they achieve on an annual basis and cost recovery goes back into that capital reserve. And that model, I think, um, might suggest a little bit lower overall goal, but with um, any overages going to that cap reserve might be a, a nice hybrid between uh, what's been presented here and, and what uh, we sort of contemplated or seen in other communities. Hey, Dan, I'm just kind of curious, is the overage relative to a goal or rel relative to like positive return on revenue? Yeah, so Dublin has this 50% goal and any overage, uh, as I understand it, and Debbie McLaughlin, I think you had um, had conversations with staff over there, um, uh, is going into a reserve. That, that is correct. They, um, two years ago, established a Parks and Recreation Department specific capital reserve fund, and it's 50% of anything over the uh, revenue target. The revenue target is 50% of the operating cost. Any revenue generated above that for the community center or their outdoor pools goes into this capital reserve. So the subsidy stays at a fixed amount, and any surplus um, is banked for, for future improvements of their facilities. So the philosophy is what I think is of interest. The threshold of 50% is what um, you know, may not be as aggressive as, as we would want a facility to be. Uh, 
other questions? Um, I guess I would just like to say that as someone who lived through the last uh, community center effort, <laughs> moment by moment, uh, we, we got beat up pretty bad about what, what Ryan brought forward. And that was that, you know, you, it won't be sustainable and therefore you'll be coming to us for taxes to, to support this building that we put in the board. Um, so I believe that coming in somewhere between the 85% cost recovery and the 106 would be um, wise in, in several ways. Yeah, and I think, you know, hearing that those um, that historical feedback and Linda, you've mentioned that a few times. I, I'm curious, Leon or, or Dan, in any of the um, other facilities that you looked at, did any of them have a sinking fund or an operating deficit reserve funded in their capital stack? Most of them have a reserve fund that's for a capital replacement uh, set up. Um, uh, I wasn't aware. I mean, I, I know uh, Dan told me about the any money that Dublin uh, makes over and above their goal that goes into an enterprise fund. Um, I would say half the agencies we work, work with, they run their recreation community center under uh, an enterprise operation like a golf course. Um, but most of the ones that are mainly set up the way we're anticipating yours, that whatever dollars they have, that uh, they're going to operate this to put dollars back because they're going to have, we never know when a pandemic issue is going to hit like it hit this year and the impact it'll have on, on a facility. And, um, and so you have uh, the ability to, to cover it just like you did with your pools this year. I mean, you had a backup a revenue source to uh, cover your pool losses this year. And, uh, and that was uh, really helped uh, the staff out as well as the, uh, the department in relationship to being able to provide that. So there's precedent already here um, that the city already has in place. And we're trying to follow that same level of precedent. Other questions? So one question, who, and I'm, get, I'm asking this to the whole group, who, who sets what we think is the right cost recovery percentage? Is that something the task force recommends to council? Does council have a strong opinion about that? Is that, you know, I mean, so my grin is because I don't know how many times Margie and I have had this same conversation. Um, so here's the guidance I, I have given to Margie and here's what I will say to this group. And I've said this on a couple different issues. Um, I think for the task force as a whole, there are certain things where we want clear recommendations and there are other things where, we're, where I think council would appreciate the knowledge and advice and, and wisdom of uh, the group. I think setting a cost recovery value is enough of a, there, there's a ton of normative kind of valuing uh, that goes into that. And I don't think it can be a purely quantitative thing. And so I do think this is an area where if, look, if the committee, if the task force wants to wrestle this and if subcommittees want to wrestle this and wrestle, wrestle it down to a number, um, I think council would appreciate that. If the group also says, um, we can't wrestle this down to a specific number, but here's what we've learned and here's kind of what we think you ought to consider. I think that's fine too. Um, ultimately, it's going to be council. Um, the question is, how much guidance does the task force feel that it can give to council appropriately with everything you've got, all, everything else you've got on your plate and recognizing that ultimately this, I mean, this is one of those things that, you know, council just made it's one of the things where why 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 they uh, why they get paid the big bucks even though they don't get paid big bucks for what is essentially a volunteer job. So um, uh, we'll guide them through that, but I think that's the the best answer I can give you. Margie, is that a fair way to kind of summarize what we talked about? Yeah, 
It, it is, and 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 thanks for that um, that point of view and that observation. Be, one of the reasons why uh, it's important to generally frame this um, based upon what we've learned and maybe not locking in is because this becomes an operational model and an operational issue for the city. And so that begins to, I think, bleed over from a task force responsibility to actually city council and the, and the city's responsibility in terms of going forward and having a more intimate understanding of your operating budget capital and operating budgets going forward. I don't know whether that's something that we really can, can nail down. So to your point, I think it would be helpful to provide some general guidance based upon what we've learned, but maybe not necessarily um, stick a stake in the ground about what it should be. Matt, does that make sense to you and others on the finance subcommittee? It makes yeah, sense. It does. I mean, I think um, it, it does. I think I think one of the things we've learned is there's a wide range of cost recovery philosophies, um, and I. So I think if if you're talking about not being as prescriptive in a recommendation or even a reflection on what we've learned, um, to narrowing narrowing it down to a range that's you know seventy to eighty percent or ninety to hundred. Um, I think that makes sense. I, I do think there, the, the what we've learned and what a general philosophy around cost recovery may be um, is a component that's going to drive your entire fee structure and a lot of your um, community support or maybe community angst. So um, I think we want to provide some latitude there where it's not as prescriptive, but I think wrestling to the ground uh, a philosophy does sound like a, a valid endeavor. I don't know, Brian, what, what are your thoughts or Todd um, around that? It's, it's a good point. Yeah, I think, I mean, to, to the points that have been made, I think, um, you know, if I'm sitting on council, the very first thing that I'm going to say, regardless of what the package looks like, is how much operational capital, put aside for a moment, how much operational support are we going to be expected to potentially provide for ongoing expenses for this? And, you know, obviously most of the sites that we've looked at have had closer to a Dublin-like model where their, you know, perceived cost recovery number is not 100%. They have openly said, we are going to do some level of subsidy. And I think, you know, at least the conversations I've had with a couple of council people over the last year have been, you know, we want to make sure that however this thing would operate, it would not necessitate such a large subsidy that it would dip in to you know, other programs that we already have or necessitate a, a revenue increase somewhere. So I think the more that we can give them, you know, I, I, I like the membership numbers we've seen here being conservative. I think we need to give them kind of a, a worst case scenario for, you know, if this gets built and our cost recovery only gets to, you know, say the 85% number, here's what that means in terms of a, a city outlay and then going forward with inflation. And, you know, I mean, one of the things I'd be interested in is how many like centers, you know, things that look like what we're proposing here actually got to 100%. Because I think in a couple of the early full commission meetings, we had, you know, a range that it seemed to me it was like a 50 to 70, 50 to 80% recovery was kind of average. Are there any comparables that we can show that are at 100% continuously? Uh, well, not necessarily in... Ohio, but there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a Monon Center here in Indianapolis and Carmel. Um, they, uh, uh, Matt, who's on your staff, used to work there. They, they operate around 104 to 105% cost recovery, and they've been doing that now for 20 years. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of look at, uh, and I, here's my thing about this, and Brian, this is a really good point. The biggest issue is how you basically activate spaces and you activate spaces through programming. And if you're driven by programming, you'll always have new people and bring more people in who then want to be members. 
if it's strictly driven as we're here to, to operate the facility, not that much to program it, you kind of slide back and you end up subsidizing it more because you're not bringing new people in and highlighting and energizing the, the building consistently. And that is a trait that um, it, it occurs in, in some parks and recreation systems. They're better at managing the facility than programming. In your case, you've got great programmers and a lot of energy and a director who really gets it because you're already operating in a business model now. So, you know, I, I think what, one of Brian, one of your, your questions feels like it's something very manageable is to look at the cost recovery, the difference. Um, what would it look like at 80%? What would it look like at 90%? Get those numbers out, um, that, those data points. We've got the baseline here. Um, I think pulling a different lever, running the stress test on what does it look like at 3,500 members as opposed to 4,400 and, and providing some of those um, data points, uh, I think will allow us to give a, a little bit more educated response on, on what the potential gaps could be if this doesn't play out as anticipated. But I think those are absolutely necessary because I, I I don't know how to back into those. Hey, Nick and, and Leon, I think to that, the other data point that I think will be helpful um, for folks to understand, and I'm pretty sure we'll get questions about is some level of sensitivity analysis on the premium, the impact of um, the premium that non-residents would pay. So um, if we're underestimating, if you're overestimating um, the number of non-residents that will have to come in, um, what does that mean? Or alternatively, you know, I, I can see there being a question of, well, you know, what happens if we get more non-residents than we anticipate joining? Um, what's the price, of, you know, what happens if we um, up that from, what do we ha would you have a 30% premium? You know, what happens if we up that to a 50% premium? You know, some sense of analysis on that, I think would be something else. Um, my, my guess is we'll get that question later on. Um, uh, as we get talking to the community. So some sense of that would be helpful as well. Okay, I think that's a good question, Steve, and we can uh, look at that. Um, you know, we put the premium in there just because there are some people who just, uh, you know, when we did the survey, we had 70% of the people said they wanted to be a member. That's a really high number. Well, within that, there are certain people say, look, I don't wanna pay for any of my programs. I just want 100% come in and use the building I can take any class I want and, I, and I'm also a member. But there's other people say, well, I wanna use the building as a member, but I don't, I'm okay if I, don't, if I wanna pay for a class. I think we're just trying to satisfy what are the best options for your community. And uh, that's where that's coming from, okay? Thank you. And I know we're running short here on time, um, or we've ran over a little, but Linda um, or Todd, you have thoughts on, um, best next steps here on the cost recovery question? Well, just globally for me, um, you know, I think that, I think that it, it, to, from Brian's perspective, which I thought was really good, hey, if I was on council, what would I want to know? And so, um, you know, we're gonna dive in as deep as anyone into these areas. So if we can say, hey, we looked at these options, here's the pros and cons with each of them and if we can get to a recommendation, that's probably helpful. If we can't, we can say, hey, here are two or three options on which you can you can go about and um, you know, turn the decision over to them. I, I agree also. Um, the other thing that I think as far as communicating with the residents is some good understanding of um, the debt payment I mean, it's kind of when you look at the revenue and expenses, paying back the debt is not very obvious. And so just making it as user friendly and, and easy to understand as possible and, and give the council as many choices as possible. I agree with. So, so to that, I think Dan and Leon, we don't, we, we are not planning on paying the debt through 
um, membership revenues. We're looking at other sources for that. So I think making that clear, and I think that might be part of why our numbers work better. Um, and I, I do have one comment that I have to make um, just because I'll, I'll let you all guess the internal reaction in my head every time I think about Brian Pereira as a council member. Um, and, and just the, the reaction that, that happens in my heart, whether that's just pure joy at that thought or something else, I'll just leave it to you guys to think. No, about. no, you, you should, you, you should, you should be wary, be very wary. <laughs> Sounds like you have a campaign manager, Brian. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's okay. I'd, I'd rather see Steve on there than any of us. <laughs> yeah. can, I, can I ask one more question? I know you're going late, but just one other way maybe to think about this. If the city, and I know they are to some degree, and Steve probably knows on top of his head, there's a certain amount of this stuff you're already subsidizing. Like you're paying for the senior center, your certain programs. So if you're already spending $500,000, you know, a year or 600 or whatever the number is, can you back into what the cost recovery needs to be if you apply that to this? Meaning saying you're already spending, say it costs you 300,000. That means we got to recover two point or 3 million. We got to recover 2.5 because we're already spending 500,000 on this. And therefore that's a 80% or 75% cost recovery. Is that one other way to look at it? And then kind of back into the membership numbers and back into what you charge people? Yeah, Debbie and Leon, I know you guys looked at that. You guys want to talk through, and Dan, I, you guys want to talk through how you handle that, because that's something I know we were taking a look at. Yeah, yeah. I can. Go ahead, Leon. No, I just said if we need to look at it and, and calculate it in a different way, I'll get with uh, Dan and, and Debbie, and we'll look at the, uh, the, those options, OK? Yeah, and I would say, Greg, to your point, what's presented here is the operating cost of everything that's going to go in the community center. So we applied our existing staff costs that are for indoor programs in this model. What we still have is the cost of our program staff for all the outside programs that we do and subsequent revenue that goes with them. So we need, so we put it all together. Here's the community center budget, here's outdoor programming budget, and then compare existing subsidies. Uh, for both of those. So that way it, it paints the full picture. And I think that that'll help um, this committee and consequently city council see how all the recreation programs fall together. Yeah, and just to, to build on that point and the point we talked about earlier to make sure I understand is, you know, this, the costs, right? There's existing costs to the senior program. That the city's paying anyways. So I think one of the things that will be important to show is that's that's not a new cost to the senior center. That's a cost the city has anyways. And there's certain costs from maintaining those facilities that we'll need to think about showing what is the incremental new cost of the fitness center separate and apart from the senior center. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I know we talked about that a few weeks ago, because um, I think that gives folks a lot of comfort then if you see a stress test that has a 70 or 80 percent membership rate against what you're projecting here, Leon, and that the negative variance falls within what we're already subsidizing. It's it's saying, hey, look, even if even if we're things are going to get this bad on a membership rate, we're still not going to be contributing more subsidy than we're already contributing or historically have contributed to existing programming. So, um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Those, those layer together. Um, the, the one, the one question that I just haven't done my homework that I had in the last question was, are any of these, um, are we rinsing any of these membership, um, projected costs through this updated survey? I know we got some really good data back in the initial survey. I don't recall, and I know that the survey was circulated and I haven't um, scrutinized it, but are we, we anticipating putting any of these numbers or ballpark numbers in that updated survey, Steve? Um, so um, I think what we, I can't, 
I don't know, Deb, I can't remember <laughs> too many numbers. Debbie, can you, Debbie or Dan, can you guys remember whether this one were, whether I don't think, you it's know, it's a telephone a survey and I don't think we get into membership cost. Okay, just curious. Yeah, that is correct. The current draft does not get to this level. What we do, what we do in the current draft ask is basically, um, we, we give the overall cost of the facility and then say, you know, if we can do it without raising taxes, how do you feel about it? If we can do it with raising taxes, um, I think we said half a mil, um, just because we had to pick a number. Um, you know, how do you feel about it? I think th those are the two questions we get to. We do not get to uh, monthly memberships. I, I do believe that's one where I think Leon and the team's experience in our research with other communities, we feel pretty confident that um, it's a competitive rate set a competitive package of rates that we're talking about um i just think to you know if we tried to go through if the surveyor had to go through that initial chart over the phone with somebody and try and get them to decide you know which rate they wanted um it, it would feel like uh, yeah we have a hang up you know, it makes it makes all the sense in the world i was just curious no it's a good question yeah just one minor point uh slightly random, but I think ultimately relevant to city council. Um, and, and that is that delicate dance you do on finding that sweet spot of how much you charge um, and what that threshold is for citizens. And, and, and I think city council is gonna hear the most about that if they, you know, if citizens are feeling like um, and this administration, if they're feeling like you're charging us too much, then th that's a delicate dance that they're going to have to do. Balancing that and people's understanding and willingness to, to participate because they love this facility and the city's ability to, to manage it ongoing and pay for it operationally without um, being stressed financially. So that becomes a little bit of a political question in terms of also what the rates will be. That makes sense. So it does. I, I do think it goes back to kind of Leon's, you know, using the old um, how many cups of coffee does it equate to uh, analogy, I think will be helpful in sorting that out. But we've said from the beginning that, and we've heard this from other members of the task force that accessibility financially um is going to be one of the things that is going to be really important so making sure that we have whether it's rates that are set at an affordable rate way or that we have some kind of a mechanism to provide um, scholarships or reduced rates or whatever you want to call it i think it's going to be something fundamentally that as we build the business plan we need to make sure it works in and, and again when you look at um setting a goal and then what happens to the money above the goal um that's another place that you can apply that Because when we toured Westerville um, last week, there was a lot of conversation about what seniors are willing to pay since they were paying nothing, I, uh, very little, if anything, right, Debbie, um, there. And when they had their own separate center and now they're incorporated into the expanded community center and there's a high level of sensitivity by seniors around what they should be paying. So that's one, that's one demographic, right? That's gonna be real, we're gonna be really sensitive around. Yeah, that is correct. They had the, um, the social level and the social level did double in price. Um, with theirs, they, um, they did add access to the walking track as part of the social level. But you're right, there was a, a good amount of um, feedback from, from the seniors as they're now having that transition time. And quickly, Debbie, because I know we want to wrap this up. What were they paying? I believe, the I believe it went from twelve to twenty-five dollars per year. Per year. Per year, and similar to our social level that we currently have. It's where you have access to the facility as a socialization gathering space and access to any of the free programs. Um, but then you pay the program fee for any fee-based programs. And, and that's consistent with what we have here with our social level. Well, I know we're, we're losing a few folks as they have um, meetings popping up. So I 
I guess I, this has been a great discussion, a lot of ground covered. Um, and I would encourage folks as always, if you have additional questions that we can work with Leon um, over the course of the next few weeks to um, provide additional data points, uh, please let me know. Um, and we'll definitely work to um, get that buttoned up from uh, for you. Um, say in, in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll work on the agenda. This is clearly an item that we'll need to, we'll, we'll go back to and revisit um, as well as the capital costs um, as refined numbers come in. So um, unless there are any final questions, I don't believe we have any public comment um, today. Uh, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Brian. Linda, Second. thank you, Linda. Thank you everyone for your time. This is, uh, look forward to connecting again in a few weeks. All right, thank you. All right, take care.